evening, Jamaica recorded an additional two COVID-19 related deaths and 130 new cases on Sunday, according to the Ministry of Health and Wellness. The deceased are a 63-year-old female from Kingston and St. Andrew and a 64-year-old male from St. Mary. Another death involving a COVID-19 patient on Sunday is under investigation. The latest fatalities bring the death toll from the coronavirus in Jamaica to 326. The 113 newly confirmed COVID-19 cases bring the total number of cases on record for the island to 14,274. 14, recoveries, meanwhile, increased by 18, bringing the total number of recoveries to 11,727. Of the newly confirmed cases, 67 are females and 46 are males, with ages ranging from 59 days to 100 years old. The cases were recorded in St. Catherine, 39, St. Anne, 18, Kingston and St. Andrew, 14, Clarendon, 10, St. Mary, 9, Manchester, 8, St. Elizabeth, 7, St. Thomas, 3, St. James, 2, Hanover, 2, and Portland, 1. There are 14 moderately ill patients and 13 critically ill patients among the 2,056 active cases now under observation in Jamaica. It was a bloody weekend with at least 10 persons killed and several others injured in multiple gun attacks across the island. Three persons were killed as marauding gunmen struck in Almond Town, St. Andrew last night. The deceased men have been identified as 21-year-old Raheem Brown, 20-year-old Connie Foster, a.k.a. Big Red, and 20-year-old Marvin Livingston, a.k.a. Diamond. Reports are that all three men and two others were standing at the roadside about 7.15 p.m. when a motor vehicle with armed men pulled up and opened fire. All five were injured and the police were alerted and the men transported to the hospital. Three were pronounced dead with two others admitted for treatment. An elderly man was also shot in Almond Town on Friday night. It was not immediately clear whether the shootings are related. Investigations continue into the shootings. When our news team visited the community earlier today, we spoke with former member of parliament for Central Kingston, Imani Duncan Price, who says it is very disheartening to see this spike in crime where all young men were murdered. We have people who have told us stories about running inside the bar, running inside their homes. They have never heard so many gunshots in Almond Town in all of their life. Some young persons telling us this. For two minutes straight, gunshots, a drive-by shooting, and friends, family members, young, young men, dead in a short space of time. And so we don't know the circumstances that caused this, but we do know when a community is hurting, it's important to come out and to give support. And importantly, it's not just this street which was impacted, but also um, Lord, Elgin. Lord Elgin, a woman, a mother, Great Blossom. and Great George's Street. Because in Almond Town community, people live together. They're friends from all over the community. And so you have parents, grandparents who have lost family. Um, one of the young men who was murdered, he has a baby who is 10 days old, 10 days old. And so to sit with his mother and sit with the baby mother of him and see the pain, you have to just talk about prayer, keeping the faith, and holding strong and trying to encourage people not to engage in any reprisals for any continuation of violence. We have to get control in this country, across our communities, yeah. around violence. We need a real plan. The police are willing, doing all that they can do, but they're under-resourced. We spoke to the police, the police um, earlier today and yesterday, and they're planned to have patrols and they've, they've been patrolling here. But when they do here, then other areas are not manned, other hotspot areas. And so if we as a country, even though it's COVID time and there's need for resources there, if we as a country can really focus on this issue and bring peace of mind to residents, allow people to have community, the wholesale shops to open, to be supported, then we can grow. 
Mrs. Duncan Price further pointed out that the issue of crime and violence in the community needs to be dealt with. The communities that make up our make up downtown Kingston have been plagued with violence of different types and for a different period of time, up and down. There have been there's been no drive-by shooting of this nature that took out so many young people at one time. I think that is what is unique. But the issue of murder, the issue of violence in these communities is something which we have to deal with. And it is not a it is not something which is a new thing which occurred. It just is an amplified situation today which went extreme. To me, one loss of life, three lives lost, it it's the same root issue. And if we don't deal with it, it's only going to get worse and worse. But it's the nature of this particular, these murders, which is shocking to people in particular. My thing is that if we don't actually deal with the individual murders as they happen, then you're going to have escalation because people don't value life. When you can kill a man who is 80 years old, right? I mean, what is that? And he no trouble, nobody. What is that? No respect for life. So that's why I say whether it is one life, as Mr. Tucker's life was lost mm -hmm. and taken away, brutally shot, murdered on Friday, or it is three men and others who are shot, three dead, it is the problem is the same problem and it has to be dealt with. Six persons, including an elderly woman, were shot and killed and the three others, including a 13-year-old boy, shot and wounded as gunmen carried out a number of armed attacks in the Norwood and Salt Spring communities over the course of the weekend leading up to yesterday afternoon. The most recent attack occurred shortly after 7 p.m. yesterday in Quarry Community Salt Spring, where armed men ambushed three persons at a premises and opened fire on them. All three persons received gunshot wounds and were rushed to the hospital where two of the victims, including the elderly woman, were pronounced dead. Earlier on Sunday morning, 43-year-old Sebastian Reed, taxi operator of Salt Spring, was shot and killed while traveling on a motorcycle along the Quarrytown Main Road. Prior to that, armed men went on a rampage in the Norwood community between Friday night into Saturday morning, killing three persons and injuring two others, including the 13-year-old boy. Those killed have been identified as 50-year-old Aubrey Brown, who was killed outside his gate along Irie Lane, and 20-year-old Nicardo Daly of Montego Bay Hills, or rather Montego Hills, as well as 47-year-old Donovan Reed of Hollywood, who is also said to be both dumb and deaf. Following the spate of shootings, a curfew was imposed in the community of Norwood, which ended today at 6 p.m. Meanwhile, National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang, in visiting the Norwood community earlier today, says this past weekend was a very difficult one with so many lives lost. There are seven, seven killings. Three took place in the area in Norwood, and last night three took place in the district of Quarry, or uh, sometimes nicknamed Waltham. On each occasion, we have had the death of innocent individuals. In one of the in individual in in hall, right where we are standing is a gentleman who is dumb and with impaired hearing. He does loading at the bus stops. They are not individuals who are involved in gangs. One of the, in the in, victim in quarry is a 76-year-old grandmother. I'd like to point out this morning that the security forces have been active in the area and we're going to increase the activity. We have had five curfews in Montego Bay since the New Year, since January 1, which means for 10 days out of the 18 days, we have had section of Montego Bay under curfew um, control. We have had nine cordon and search operations, external to those operations. And there's a, a, for 24 7 days, five operational teams on the ground, joint operational teams led by superintendent and officers of the Army, Cambridge. Montego Bay and Baritone, all covered by heavy security presence. In fact, the area where the killing took place in Quarry was under curfew over the holiday, and I think that was only released about a week ago. It is noticeable that on Friday morning last week, were some 
percent behind in homicide, which is about 10 less than last year. Um, over this weekend, we have seen 25 killings across Jamaica. Two triple and a double included. The triple here in St. James, triple in Almond Town, and two in, in, in the area near Olympic Gardens. Dr. Chang also outlined the steps that will be taken to try and stop the shootings and killings and also bring those responsible to justice. The police intends to increase the activity. We are not deterred by this kind of brazenness. We will increase the curfew on cordons. We will increase the curfews. And in addition to that, the special operations moving out. We have developed the fugitive apprehension teams which is smaller groups which target high value of targets. And they are supported by the special op teams. So once they're identified and their location can be clearly, um, you know, unknown, they'll be apprehended and prosecuted. I also take the opportunity to inform the public that the entire intelligence apparatus of the security forces focus on the gangs and getting the guns and disrupting their operation throughout and apprehending especially the leadership of the gangs. That I'd like to point out, of the five recent incidents or well-known incidents of large shipment of farms in the island, with, there has been a lot of excitement generated by the last one, but the fact is that the police have maintained vigilance and investigation. In also visiting the quarry community, Dr. Chang explained what preliminary investigations are showing as to the cause of the shootings in that area over the weekend. It appeared one gang from neighboring community hit the, the, the quarry gang. Um, there was a shooting on the highway near the quarry on the road. Um, a gentleman was hit in the shoulder by a bullet and then he crashed and died. That's the Tyler who was going home. He's from the Salt Spring area and they seem to have a response to that. This particular incident here is, one cannot trace a direct retaliation. But we know they've been having tension here for a while, so it's quite a bit of a surprise. The bar was also only recently roamed. But clearly, I said all the perpetrators are identified as gangsters. Um, and whether they're killing innocent or they're killing each other, we have to stop the killing. And we're going to apprehend and lock them down. In this incident, Based on the video thing, we have had been able to apprehend a number of them, but of course, if we don't get the kind of witness statement that is required, we cannot retain, detain them. It's still, the, the cameras can identify them, but I'm not sure that the quality of these cameras are level for evidence. And it's one of the things that I'll be raising my colleague to, where citizens are willing to put up cameras to ensure we get the appropriate quality equipment, even if we have to put them, you know, acquire them ourselves and put them in place. But we have been able to identify that. And they have been apprehending most of the individuals. Some we have to release because we're not getting the witness coming forward. But we'll not be deterred. We're going to go forward. And as I said, the structural changes in the force have taken place. We're going to make the legislative changes come forward. And we're going to count for the equipment that is required to make sure that the police can get the job done efficiently. They're working hard, jointly with the security, with the, with the army and they have had some success and we're going to have more success. Attorney General of Jamaica, Marlene Malahu Ford, also visited the Norwood community with Dr. Chang, where she pointed out that the state will do its part in fighting crime while urging residents in these communities to also do their part. The country has been calling on the state to act, and the state will act, and the state will call upon citizens to do their part. Uh, the level of brazenness and utter disregard for life and public order that we are seeing and what has been brought to our attention on this morning cannot be viewed as normal and cannot be accepted. So legislation go through various stages and the critical thing for this administration is to ensure that they are effective and that they can be implemented and enforced with relative ease. So it's not just so that they are delayed, it is because of the many stages and it is also because of what we are doing at the different stages in informing ourselves. But the Firearms Act, we have the Enhanced Security Measures um, Act proposed 
uh, new revisions to the Bail Act coming and another suite from the Ministry of National Security, which are going to be priority, and all of them are dif at different stages. I'm now reviewing the revised policy for the Bail Act, and we're now in a third or fourth round of assessment of the Enhanced Security Measures Act. Uh, it is my intention also to ask for an expedited hearing of the appeal dealing with the state of public emergency that is now before the Court of Appeal. And the counsellor for the Montego Bay Northeast Division, Charles Sinclair, during last Friday's St. James Council meeting, says the state of emergency SOE and Zone of Special Operations, ZOSO, are significant within the parish of St. James, as he expressed concerns over the recent spike in crime since the start of the year. We did very well with the implementation of state of emergency, which came to St. James in the first instance. And the zone of special operation came to St. James also in the Mount Salem division in the first instance and has done significant work up in the Mount Salem era where it has been implemented. But when you look on the result in relation to murder that it went down to what is a 17-year low coming out of the SOE. And then we have started 2021 without an SOE. And it seems that some people just believe that they can exhibit some bravery again because you hear some things cropping up a little too often. And I want to say it is, is, it, it is not because of the police not trying, you know, because they are in fact trying. You see them out on the road, you see them in communities quite often in heavy numbers. But I believe, honestly believe, that the SOE has a, some significance, psychologically or otherwise, it has a significance, beyond just having police and soldiers out there. Councillor Sinclair in making reference to the find at the Montego Freeport Wharf last weekend of 19 firearms and a number of ammunitions had this to say. Someone or persons tried to import into Jamaica 19 illegal firearms. Six of them being high-powered weapons, rifle, 400 and odd rounds of ammunition for AK-47 and so, some 45, because when I looked on the photos that were circulated, this is some serious ammunition, a recognized port, one that is manned by persons. It must mean that there are persons who are in the system. And when I say in the system, I don't know which part of the system, but you have people who operate, whether they operate from Steve Adour, to offload ship, somebody must have been involved from within for somebody to take that up, make a chance to import 19. Because everything at the port is supposed to be scanned based on the information that I have. So you know, Mr. Chairman, is that within this country of Jamaica, people who walk amongst us, is that we have some people that I am going to brand them as terrorists. Because it could only be a terrorist, Mr. Chairman who would have contemplated bringing into Jamaica that type of weapon and weapons. And the only purpose that you can get from a firearm and gunshot is for people to be murdered. It couldn't be for any other reason. Councillor Charles suggested that a hard and drastic action should be taken against persons who want to import things into the country with the sole purpose of causing mayhem such as illegal guns and ammunition. Well, you know, in 2011, the previous administration passed what a, is now part of our constitution, which is called the Charter of Rights. And it is the Charter of Rights that everybody in Jamaica clings to and says that I have the right to this and I have the right to that. And I would support them having the right to it, but the only person who ha should have those rights and should be able to call upon those rights are law-abiding law people, not criminals, mm -hmm. are people who have ill intent, should not get the benefit 
of any of those rights. But sometimes it may be that all this reform that we're talking about, constitution, coming from the mouths of some persons, probably the reform that we need to have is to, the reform that is going to allow the government that has a duty to protect the life of every citizen of Jamaica to take some hard and drastic action against persons who behave and conduct themselves as terrorists and want to import into our country things that are not manufactured here for the sole purpose of causing mayhem. National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang earlier today says that one of the suspects in the guns and ammunition find at the Montego Bay Wharf has been arrested and more arrests are to come. The leader of the first shipment, Mr. Rooms, is in prison. The leader of the second shipment is on trial at this we speak. He is a known leader of one of the big gangs in this region. It's one of, it, one of the leaders of one of the other incidents will be closing on him very fast. Info, intel is there, evidence is gathered, and he'll soon be apprehended. And the other two are, including the one of the 11th of January, is under intense investigation. We are maintaining a level of intel operation that is providing information. We are disrupting the flood guns, but it is coming in, in large quantities. In, a, in addition to that, the anti-gang activity is at its peak as a priority and we we'll have five serious investigations ongoing in addition to those who are already in jail. And we'll be closing in at least on two of them very quickly as we speak. The anti-gang activity is led by CTOC, but it has a full collaboration of MOCA, the Military Intelligence Unit, and the National, Investigative, National Intelligence Bureau of the Police Force. So in fact, the force is now structured as a body, security teams, to deal with our gangs in this country. And that's what we're doing and working at. The fugitive apprehension teams I indicated are focused on individuals and are moving across the country to apprehend those targets. In other news, a curfew has been imposed in sections of Clarendon. The curfew began at 6 p.m. on Sunday, January 17, and will remain in effect until 6 p.m. on Tuesday, January 19. During the hours of the curfew, all persons within the boundaries are required to remain within their premises unless otherwise authorized in writing by the ground commander. 22-year-old Xavier Woolery, recording artist of East Avenue, Linstead, St. Catherine, has been missing since Thursday, January 14, 2021. She is of brown complexion and slim built. Reports are that at about 6 p.m., Woolery was last seen at home wearing black shorts, pink blouse, and black slippers. She has not been heard from since. Anyone knowing her whereabouts is being asked to contact the Linstead Police at 876-985-2680, Police 119 Emergency Number, or the nearest police station. 71-year-old Milton Turner of Barry Street, Kingston, has been missing since Tuesday, January 12. He is of brown complexion, slim built, and about 175 centimeters, that is 5 feet 7 inches tall. Reports are that at about 6 p.m., Turner was last seen at home. His mode of dress at the time he went missing is unknown. He has not been heard from since. Anyone knowing his whereabouts is being asked to contact the Central Police Station at 876-922-8860, Police 119 Emergency Number, or the nearest police station. Investigators from the St. Andrew South Division are probing the circumstances surrounding the murder of a woman and her daughter in Olympic Gardens, Kingston 11, on Sunday, January 17. They are 52-year-old Ella Pasco and 32-year-old Natoya Pasco, both of Dudney Road, Olympic Gardens, Kingston 11. Reports from the Hunts Bay Police are that at about 11 a.m., both women were at home when they were approached by a gunman who opened fire hitting them. 
the police were summoned and the women taken to the hospital where they were pronounced dead. Investigations are ongoing. And finally, in the news tonight, at a recommitment church service held yesterday at the Boulevard Baptist Church in St. Andrew, members of the opposition People's National Party, PNP, led by President Mark Golding, gathered to reflect and refocus on the party's political mandate of nation building. Anglican Archbishop of the West Indies, Dr. Howard Gregory, who delivered the sermon, urged attendees to reconcile their differences as the party attempts to bridge internal divides, an effort which PNP President Mark Golding said was critical in order for the party to restore public faith in their political platform. As your president today, I recommit to leading with courage and conviction on the shoulders of all who have served before and through the guidance and direction of Almighty God. I have assumed this leadership position with humility, with optimism, and a deep sense of responsibility. As your leader, I recommit myself to our movement as I ask you to join me in doing so. We are moving beyond and away from the millstones of factionalism, internal discord, and the elevation of selfish personal ambitions about the collective interests of our great party. We recognize that the Jamaican people are turned off by those negative influences and tendencies, and that the fortunes of our movement will only be restored if we unequivocally reject them and genuinely embrace unity around our common purpose. So we recommit ourselves to what is really an existential task. It requires both an act of will and of faith. It is a matter of deliberate choice. In his charge to attendees, Mr. Golding was adamant that it was time for reconciliation among the party's leadership and membership, and also to heal wounds that might still be lingering. Choosing the path of reconnection with the people of Jamaica, choosing the path of development of a solid, progressive policy platform which tackles the deep structural challenges facing our country, Choosing the path of strengthening our messaging and our communications, both internally and with the wider public of Jamaicans at home and abroad. Choosing the path of rebuilding our organization from the base to the center. Choosing the path of widening our financial base and strengthening our finances. Choosing the path of commitment to integrity and honesty in the conduct of our affairs and the nation's business. And ultimately, choosing the path of a bright future for our party and our nation. So, my comrades and friends, we are on an exciting journey to a better place. All are welcome under this big tent. All that is asked of us is a true and authentic commitment to the values and principles of our great party, to uniting our movement, and to working together for the benefit of all. But please, I ask you to understand this. We cannot sit still. We cannot afford the luxury of vacillation or procrastination. It is a time for action. The train to our brighter future is leaving, so please get on board. Mr. Golding was also joined at the recommitment service by newly elected party chairman and Kingston Eastern Member of Parliament, Philip Paulwell, as well as a former Member of Parliament for St. Anne Northwestern, Dr. Dayton Campbell, who is now the party's General Secretary. And those are the stories making news. I am Tamar McHale. We will now take a break and then join Christopher Scott with sports.